What if I told you that there was an array method so powerful that it could replace more than half of all the other array methods? A method so impactful that it alone can take you most of the way to mastering functional programming in JavaScript. A method so versatile that it can let you do almost anything. This is all about Reduce. Humanity. Reduce is a method that takes an array of values and reduces them all down to a single value. It can be used in almost any situation where you might normally use a loop. One very common situation is when we want to add up all the numbers in an array. So we'll use that as our first example. The reduce way of doing this has a lot of similarities to the way we would do it with a loop, and it produces the same result but it doesn't reassign any values, so we can make all of our variables constants, which is nice. We say that reduce is a higher order function because it's a function where one of the inputs is also a function. More specifically, this inner function is called a reducer, and it describes how we're gonna combine the values of the array. You can write the reducer inline as an anonymous function, or it can be defined separately as a named function. It can be nice to keep it separate in case you want to reuse the reducer for another array, but it's your choice. By the way, if you're not comfortable with arrow functions, you could also write the reducer in the form of a more traditional function, but for this video, we're going to keep using arrow functions. And they're a good thing to get used to anyway. Either way, when we call reduce, it'll have some expectations about how it's going to use this function, so the parameters are important. The basic idea is that the reducer function will be called once for every value of the array from left to right. Every time it's called, the current value of the array is given as the second argument of the reducer. The first argument is called the accumulator, which is basically the part that snowballs through the array, building up into what will eventually be returned as the result of the reduce call. On the first call of the reducer, the accumulator will start with the value of the second argument given to reduce, and then whatever the reducer outputs, that value will be assigned as the accumulator for the next call of the reducer. That's probably a lot to digest, so let's walk through our first example. So in this case, there are four elements in the array, so the reducer will be called four times. The initial value of the accumulator is zero, since that's what was given as the second argument of the reduce call. The initial value of num will be two, since that's the first array element. The reducer adds these two values together, so the output will be zero plus two, which is two. So now two will be the value of the accumulator in the next call of the reducer, and num will be negative five, since that's the next value in the array. Two plus negative five is negative three, so that'll be given as our next value for sum, and one will be the next value of num. When we add these up, we get negative two as the next value for sum, and we'll feed in seven as the last value for num. Adding those up gives us five, and now we've reached the end of the array. So that's what the reduce will return. Something important to notice is that reduce is not a mutating method, which means that we're not changing any values in the array when we call it. In fact, we're not even actually modifying the value of the accumulator, we're just calling the reducer function again with a different value. So all of this is totally immutable, which is part of why it's very popular in functional programming. A reducer can also have a third parameter, which represents the index of the current element, and a fourth parameter, which represents the array that it's being called on. It's a lot more rare that we'll need to use these, so most reducers will just have two parameters. By the way, you might have also heard that you can omit the second argument in the reduce call, and it'll just use the first array element as the initial accumulator value. And then the first call of the reducer will use the second element as the current array value. For primitive type accumulators, that'll work most of the time, but you'll get an error if the array is empty, so it's probably better to just not risk it. When we have the opportunity to be more explicit about what we want, we should take it. Okay, let's try another example. To really get the hang of this, we don't want to change too much, so let's just try multiplying all the array values instead of adding them. 
So the most important distinction here is that the output of the reducer is different now, since we want to multiply instead of adding the elements. We're also setting the initial value of the accumulator to 1 instead of 0, because otherwise all of these elements would get multiplied by 0, so the final result would be 0 every time. You might also notice that we're using a different name for the accumulator, since it no longer represents a sum. You can call these variables whatever you want, it's only the order of them that matters. So I'd always just recommend choosing variable names that make sense in the context of what we're doing. In this example, the accumulator will start as 1, 1 times 2 is 2, 2 times negative 5 is negative 10, negative 10 times 1 is still negative 10, negative 10 times 7 is negative 70, and that's the product of all our numbers. Nice. Okay, so up to this point we've been looking at numbers, but we could use reduce with arrays of any type. We could use Boolean operations to do something similar to the dot every or dot sum array methods. We could use reduce to put together an array of strings similar to the dot join method. Or if we wanted to do something more extreme, we could even compose an array of functions to combine them all into a single function. And these last two in particular are good examples of cases where order matters. We would get a different result if we were to go through the array in the opposite order. If we did want the accumulator to be calculated from right to left instead, there's a sibling method called reduce right, which works exactly the same as reduce and uses the same parameters for the reducer. The only difference is that it goes from right to left instead. This is basically the same as if we were to reverse the array before reducing, but this way it doesn't modify the array. Another thing worth mentioning is that our accumulator doesn't need to combine every value of the array. We could use it to do something like count the number of negative values in an array. We could use it to find the maximum value, similar to math.max. Or we could even do something like find the longest string in an array, which is actually something we can't do with math.max. So our accumulator can be any primitive type, but what if we wanted it to be like an array or an object? We can do that too. Let's look at an example where we want to take an array of numbers and add one to every value. So now our accumulator will be an array, or more accurately, it's a pointer to an array, which will be relevant later. On each step, we can create a new array which contains all the previous elements of the accumulator from the previous call as well as the current element plus one. I'm using the spread operator to get all the elements of the previous array, but you could also use dot concat or something like that if you prefer. And that's it, we have an array containing all of the array values plus one. Another way we could do this would be to modify the existing array instead of creating a new one on each step. We can do this because the accumulator is a pointer to the array, so when we assign it to the next accumulator, it can still point to the same array. This way of doing it is no longer functional, but it can be hundreds of thousands of times faster depending on the size of the array, so this might be the better choice if speed is our highest priority, like if we're making a game or something like that. We could also make an array accumulator that doesn't use every value. For example, if we wanted an array containing just the odd numbers. Just like in the previous example, we'll use an array accumulator that starts as empty. And then, on each step, we'll check if the current number is odd. If it is, then the next accumulator will be an array containing all the previous accumulator's elements as well as the current number. If the number isn't odd, we'll just return the same accumulator as last time. The array won't change. So our final output is an array containing 7, 1, and 3. In other words, it's all the odd numbers from the array we started with. Which is great. And we could also do this in the mutating way if we wanted to. You might have noticed that these last two examples are doing the same thing as the dot map and dot filter methods respectively. 
But reduce can also do things that we can't do with dot map and dot filter. Let's say, for example, that we wanted an array containing the products of each neighboring pair of elements. One of the ways we can use reduce for this is to include the third and fourth reducer parameters we briefly mentioned earlier, since we're now interested in the index of each element. Our accumulator will start as an empty array, and then on each step, we'll return an array containing all the values of the accumulator, as well as our new product. And we get that new product by multiplying the current element by the next element in the array. In other words, the element of the array with the current index plus one. And we'll continue like this until we reach the final array element, at which point, I will no longer be less than the array length, and so we'll just return the accumulator products. And that's it. Now we have our array containing all of the adjacent pair products. By the way, you might be wondering why we would even bother using the fourth parameter instead of just referring to the array itself. Great question. The main reason is that this makes the reducer reusable. We can apply it to other arrays and it'll work just as well. We can also use an object as our accumulator. A common example would be if we wanted to count how many times each character appears in a string of text. Our accumulator will begin as an empty object and on each step we'll add one to the count of the current character. In case we haven't encountered this character yet, we can use the knowledge coalescing operator to start the count at a default value of zero. And since reduce only works with arrays, we'll need to start by converting the string to an array of characters. I'm using the spread operator to do this, but there are other ways. I'm also using the spread operator to copy the contents of the previous accumulator object before modifying the count of the current character. So now our final output is the count of each character. There are three S's and one A in our string. And just like the array accumulator examples, we can do this in the much faster non-functional way if we're concerned about computation time. So now we know how to make more complicated accumulators that can do some really powerful stuff, but you might be wondering, what if we wanted to use more than one accumulator at a time? Well, we can do that too. For a relatively simple example, let's say we have an array of numbers and we want to find the minimum and maximum values without having to iterate through the whole array more than once. Technically, we'll still have only one accumulator, but it'll be an object that contains the minimum and maximum values, and we'll modify both of them at the same time. By the way, you might have noticed these extra parentheses around the output. We need to include those when the output is an object, otherwise it'll be interpreted as a multi-line arrow function expression. The initial value of the accumulator will be an object with min as infinity and max as negative infinity. The infinity and negative infinity are just there to make sure that whatever value we get first will replace both of these, no matter what, no matter how large or small that value is. And that's it, now we have our minimum and maximum value, although we only had to go through the array once. So now that kind of illustrates the point, but it's not all that impressive. We can do this for more complicated things too. For example, let's say we wanted to get an array of prefix sums, which is a common technique for a lot of algorithmic coding challenges. To create this array efficiently, we want to keep track of the sum of all the elements we've encountered so far so that we don't need to keep looping through it each time. So our accumulator will be an object that stores the current sum of all the elements we've encountered so far, as well as an array that keeps track of all those sums as we encounter them. In the output, since we're just asking for the dot list part of this, we'll just get an array containing 8, 5, 5, and 11 which is the prefix sums. Great. And once again, if we're really concerned with maximizing the speed, we can also do this in a non-functional mutating way. Okay, so we've looked at a great variety of examples, but this is really just a small sample of all the amazing things you can do with Reduce. I believe that the only way to really master a skill is to practice a lot. You can use these prompts for some extra practice, and I'd also recommend trying it out in the wild. Next time you find yourself thinking about using a loop, try to think about how you could do it with Reduce. 
If you're looking for help on converting some code to use Reduce, you can submit it to the Coding Serenity Discord. This is a place to go if you have any questions, comments, or concerns about this or any other coding topic. You can also offer suggestions for future videos because I'll probably be making more content about Reduce. As for now, thanks for watching. And remember, the first step is believing you can do it. Bye for now.